Imiolo has been standing here now for almost 200 years. To know the legacy and the responsibility that comes with continuing that legacy of not only what Makulayana did here, but what the Lord did through Makulayana. And it's incredible for me to, to now, I guess you could say, minister in the, the shoes of Makulayana. In this, on the same property, the same church, and even with some of the same families that run, they can trace their genealogy all the way back to the days of Mokulayana. I know my mother was born in 1931, and I'm not sure when her parents were born, but <clears throat> my grandmother moved here from Hilo, um, and she'd grown up at Haile Church. It was her family's church, and it still is her family's church. And so my mother was raised here, as were we. And so the whole family went to church. And people here, you know, from the tutus to the little kids, everybody knew when you were born. They knew who your parents were. They knew who your grandparents and your great-grandparents. They all knew who they were, and they all had connections with them. And I, I think it's, it's that legacy that uh, is very important. And really to understand Imiola as a Christian church, as a Christian legacy in North Hawaii, I think we have to understand what happened a few years before the missionaries arrived. As you know, Kamehameha died in 1819. And up to his death, the old religious system that had been carried on for hundreds and hundreds of years in Polynesia was the spiritual philosophy, the religious philosophy of the Hawaiians. What people don't realize is that when he died, it was 40 years after Captain Cook discovered the islands. When he died, his wife, Queen Kaumanu, and his young son decided that the old ways that Kamehameha had kept intact had to change. They were being bombarded by a universe that they knew nothing about. So they decided to end the couple system, the religious system. That created a vacuum, a void. As Kaumanu became queen and, and, and began to realize the oppression of the kapu system. And, and then slowly, I believe again, through the sovereignty of God, God used her to break it down and, and slowly diminish that. And, and then came the gospel message, the love of Jesus. And it's, it's really cool when you look at the timeline of it and just look at it because you can really see an outside influence upon the whole thing. And I believe that's the hand of God that was on all of this because he loved the Hawaiian people. And, and so then he, he prepared the way for the missionaries. Now, while all that was going on in 1819 and the decision to break the couple, over in New England, there were a bunch of Hawaiians. And one of them was a very famous person today, Henry Opu Kahaia, who was a cabin boy and then brought up in a Christian manner among the sailors and a captain who brought him to New England. What was happening in New England at the time, which was the second great awakening, a significant religious revival going on in that area. They brought native people from the various countries into Cornwall, Connecticut to, to be students at the foreign mission school. One of those students was Opukahaia. And it was through him that ultimately the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions planned a mission to Hawaii. And he was going to be the missionary to lead it. Unfortunately, Opukahaia died in 1818, before the mission got formed. Edwin Dwight assembled his writing into a memoirs. And that, that book really motivated a bunch of uh, people in New England about why don't we go to Hawaii. Henry Opukahia, 
He was the one that proved. He was the one that demonstrated that Hawaiians can indeed become good Christians. And then there were others who were listening to him. Many other young men, people who wanted to be part of this whole fervor of Christianizing the world. And one of them was Lorenzo Lyons. He was with the fifth company of missionaries who came to Hawaii. So uh, when um, Reverend uh, Lorenzo Lyons first moved here, this is uh, the area that they brought him to, this uh, rubble of rocks where once the foundation and um, you can see remnants of the cement or the mortar that they used. This small house site had a chimney or fireplace and the purpose of the fireplace was uh, basically to cook in and to, to warm their, um, their residence. But that was the center of the house. Uh, eventually, uh, they lived here for uh, about 20 years before the house was extended on, but uh, their living space was not extended. And it encompassed a area for him to give medical attention to the people of this uh, village at that time, Waimea. And then on the edge of that was uh, the post office, the first post office, he was the first postmaster. That was uh, 1855 when this extension went in. They assigned him from Hamakua to Puako. That's almost like 40 miles. There's no highways, there's only these old Hawaiian trails. He walks down to Waipio on the old switchbacks. The best hikers in the world today would take several days to get down there. And he, he used to do this. Every, he, his tour took four to five weeks. And Hawaiians, by the thousands, came to listen. Uh, Makua and Lana established the property and he built the church. And if you come to this church, you see the outside stone wall that represented the exterior, exterior wall of the church. Partway down the wall, maybe about two feet off the ground, there's a small little shelf in the wall. And the small little shelf is where the floor of the church was. It burned and they rebuilt it. They built this structure here. And at that time, koa was the cheapest wood you could find, where the whole place was the koa forest. Um, you know, Lorenzo Lyons started uh, Imiola, and he started a couple other churches after that. And the church down at Kwai Hai, which was called Kiaho Church, was one of those churches. You know, um, so he was a special guy. The Hawaiians loved Lorenzo Lyons. I think the Hawaiians called him Makua. You know, so he. Uh, you know, he went down there, he prayed for the sick, he, uh, uh, and, and, and he was all, and you know, back then they, there was no cars. So, you know, from Waimea, I mean, I'm thinking about it, from Waimea to Kauai Hai, he walked. But, um, so he, that's how he started. He started just uh, loving on the Hawaiian people. You realize how important that is? Not only preaching about God, but also demonstrating his love for Hawaii and Hawaiians. That connection is the legacy of Reverend Lorenzo Lyons. Uh, so when you start looking at his name, why did they call him Makua Laiana? Because he was like their father. You know, he could speak the language, he could write the language, he was transferring um, all these um, hymns and everything into Hawaiian. And this is where he did it, right here, you know, in this little space. Um, the missionaries used hymns to teach and missionaries wrote hymns to share their messages. Um, Lorenzo Lyons was significant part of that. And that's why, you know, when he wrote what is almost like the Hawaiian National Anthem, Hawaii Aloha. E Hawaii, e kuhome. My dearest land, I don't know where I was born. 
Olie, Olie, rejoice, rejoice in this beautiful land that you have. Yeah. E aloha, e alei. You know, the love of Hawaii. That was the man. If you look at all the verses of Hawaii Aloha, you can see his heart in that. What he felt for the land, he became part of this. He became a keiki hokaina, you know. He, he became part of the land, part of the people. One of the, the best ministers you could find in the history of Hawaii. You know, I, uh, I come here every Sunday. I feel Lorenzo Lyons. <laughs> yeah. I feel the call of Obugaia. Yeah. I feel the passion and dedication of that man. It's a wonderful place to worship. And on his tombstone, you'll see the words, the last words. Aloha Yaya, so beloved, most Lorenzo Lions. You know, this, this great man with such humble facilities, you know, could create ideas and feelings and thoughts and music that, that will last to eternity. What a place, what a man. <laughs>